Chind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adiya Chind. You all can see I have with me Lieutenant General Ravi Shankar. On this part two of the analysis, in terms of what lessons can India learn from the war in Ukraine, a lot of people again. I'm going to repeat this, which I said in my last episode as well. Are going to tell you about what's happening on the ground, who's attacking where, and this and that and the other. What we are here is not to study the tactical position of the troops. or as you know as you would say we're not here to study the ground battle we are here to study the 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 general objective were the russians able to meet it or were the ukrainians able to meet their objectives what are the salient features of the battle that have come out and those are critical for india to understand because that is a part of modern warfare that india could face so thank you so much the last video is doing very well and um, you know we've got very good reviews about that and i hope we can actually continue this yeah thanks a lot uh, we should continue this because like you said uh, per se there's a overload of ukraine you know in all media everyone tells minute by minute what is happening uh, but what is lacking is what is the takeaway at each stage and what is the takeaway with respect to india right what is it that we have to do that's why we had the non military lessons earlier we'll consider the military lessons now let's shoot minute to minute as it is is difficult sir because who can actually guarantee anything yeah that? yeah i agree with you um sir military is an arm of politics and that's something that you had you know i agree with you also brief you also told me a story about it which was very interesting politically what were the aims of uh, vladimir putin getting into ukraine which were given to its military commander sir yeah it was clausewitz who had said it's a old dictum that you uh, know war is a politics uh, by other means uh, you know equally mao had said uh, politics is war without bloodshed and war is politics with bloodshed both these are right so let's see the whole story of why uh, russia has gone into ukraine is a political objective what is the political objective one if you get that clear the rest everything falls in line uh ukraine wanted to join eu it wanted to join nato At the moment that happens it is out of the russian sphere of influence uh, traditionally ukraine and russia are sister countries really same people same stock same culture same ethnicity and putin didn't want rush ukraine to go out of its sphere of influence and you know when the soviet russia broke up uh, russia or the russian federation could do very little to ensure that these people you know dissipated many countries joined nato lithuania estonia albania all these people joined nato and eu and all that poland Uh, Slovakia, all these, you know, they're part of the Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, the ones which were left off were Ukraine, the Five Stans, Kazakhstan, and you know, Central Asian republics, Belarus. All right. Now, in the meanwhile, the Russian economy picked up and it started regaining its strength with uh, being an energy uh, surplus nation, energy exporter. as it started revitalizing itself naturally russia wanted to ex- expand its sphere of influence so the first belarus was always with russia and they wanted ukraine also to be perfectly with them uh say a few years back they had a guy called timoshenko who was almost a puppet of uh, russia who was the president of ukraine in some kind of a revolution which took place right he was overthrown and uh, zelensky came into the play and he was drifting towards nato and uh, eu and it was not acceptable to putin and russia i wouldn't say putin it's russia also when we have been demonizing putin in the media but russia as a whole also right the entire uh, kremlin they don't want that to happen they are looking at resurgence of russia as a superpower with its own sphere of influence so this is something which uh, was not acceptable so they want ukraine fully in the grip of uh, russia that's why this war and putin has laid down conditions it should not be part of you nato it should not you know it should be under us all that so that's it. 
regime change one of the biggest things that he had meant yeah so the political see if you look at it what is the aim of this war regime change get a change in fact i just read in the news they want to get that uh, yan uh, yanukovic back mm. as a president that chap is sitting in belarus so he will be put forward as president they want this chap to go but that's uh, that will let you how it goes they have kind of invigorated a country which probably won't have given them as much as a threat <laughs> it's a different story altogether so you know uh, the information ops that was conducted uh, by both the parties uh, and uh, to to come up with the actually a you know scenario within that information campaign which was on even the ukrainians publicly kind of did not believe that the invasion was coming and uh, you know yesterday i spent the day actually watching these travel bloggers who get into war zones and stuff like that and this guy was in ukraine on the 25th even then the ukrainians were saying ah it's just a little bit here and there it won't happen um so the information campaign run by russia was also a lot you know very uh, effective to a large extent how do you see the gray zone operation which actually led into the battle um the opening salvo as per se see uh, i think uh, mr putin was very clear from the start what he is going to do so he moved his forces and he you know all coercion tactics he led out a information campaign and you know what and then he put down his demands uh, on nato he put down his demands on germany he put down his demands on usa and the works usa on the other hand you know combined their in, information and intelligence operations and they kept telling everyone hey, what is russia up to and then you know put in put a smoke screen by going to beijing and you know all that and making a show that he's not going to uh, get in so it was some kind of a deception which he was the thing was playing so in this entire thing ukraine refused to believe that uh, putin will attack or rather russia will attack right they believed that you know well all this will be posturing there might be some problem maybe he will not get into kiev and belarus and all that maybe he will try to hive off the donbas region right so he potent could mask his intent to ukrainians and who refused to believe what was happening but then i'll qualify it though they refused to believe what was to happen it seems that they prepared based on the hint otherwise they wouldn't have done what they did the military has prepared based on the in provided by the americans though they didn't expect this to happen that is why they have been able to put up so much resistance i will talk about it later hmm. this actually matches up to what happened with india as well in 20 <coughs> 2020 june when the chinese were also doing exercises the russians were doing exercises and suddenly some sort of a activity if i may put it that yeah. way this is a full scale invasion but we had some sort of incursions that happened yeah 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 so a similar deception uh, is what yes. i do you agree yeah they he uh, R- russia mounted a good deception campaign also so the opening salvo i mean uh, they they basically started up uh, you know the campaign with long range fire power and so on and so forth i would actually go on to the fire power question a little later and you being the dg artillery would be able to actually throw a very good uh, perspective on this entire thing uh, the kinetic war looking at the gains that they've got today and the enclaves that they've been able to make for themselves uh, was the planning as sound as is being portrayed to be and uh, what can we learn in india from this multi uh, attack yeah, uh, look we've started with the political aim Yes, sir. If the aim was political, and the the political aim was regime change, the military actions should have contributed to that directly. Mm. So that means your point uh, of your military uh, plan should have been reach Kiev, get hold of Zelensky, depose him publicly, and put a new guy in. as quickly as possible even if it meant undertaking an air assault that didn't happen 
yes the russians are still in the outskirts of kiev they are still in kherson and kharkiv and all but the crux they missed that's the that's the crux of this problem right but i'd like to put something else which is i think very fundamental in this entire operation let we'll us go back a little in time in 2008 uh there was a problem between the uh, in south ossetia and georgia mm. russia intervened in, on the side of uh, ossetia and defeated georgia with overwhelming force unrestricted then come to 2014 russia deployed force ukraine backed out and they took off crimea just show of force they started uh, arming the rebels in donbas that is donetsk uh, donetsk and luzans and uh, ukraine didn't do much about it so there's a mental conditioning and thinking on the part of uh, russia that to topple this government doesn't take much effort mm. you know show them a force coerce them into it and they'll fall and take over what happened is a different thing so what is it that the premises by on which uh, russia went into this the fundamentally wrong wo kehta na mutual fund mein kya bolte hain past winter read the offer documents carefully before investing yeah read the offer documents carefully past returns are not the guarantee for future yeah. returns past performance is not a guarantee that's what happened they have gone on the past matrix without understanding the new matrix which came up that's the fundamental flaw in the entire process so my question and comparing to india's situation when we went into bangladesh we also had a multi pronged approach uh you know the russian seems to be a very very you know planned army and the kind of operations they've done before are, have been precise uh today i don't see them doing what they did before that's point number 1 and what we did in bangladesh was basically surround the pass centers and literally force the entire you know uh, regime to uh, back down we had no, blockaded no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait. you are know, Bangladesh was a convergent operation. Mm. If you look at Bangladesh, it's hardly about three, four hundred kilometers mm. end to end. So you went from all round and converged onto Dhaka. All your prongs were converging. Now oh, this is a country which is nearly thousand kilometers up and down. From the border to Kiev itself is two hundred kilometers. The distance between Kiev and Kharkiv is four hundred kilometers. Mm. now you put one prong in the north one prong in the south and one prong in the uh, you know west all these three prongs are hanging in mid air uh, they are not mutually supporting each other whereas in our case all their all were converging and mutually supported you could switch forces from one to the other you could switch firepower from one to the other you could switch logistics from one to the other if the prong got stuck you could help in bangladesh not here you can't do that Mm. and all of them don't uh, contribute to the main aim yes right the main aim was key was key was that there should be concentration of force there there should be you know there's a principle of war called uh, selection and maintenance of aim and concentration of force both these were violated in this case look let me we'll finish this business of multi prong fully here on this so that we don't come back to this oh. when you undertake three prongs like this each uh, you know 40 to 100 kilometers in depth and you're encountering resistance which means that this you have to have a corridor through which your forces go now that corridor has to be protected like hmm. you have to have corridor protection typically you need corridor protection so you need to put troops there then you need logistics the moment you take out logistics and corridor protection out of the whole prong what is left at the head the teeth 
is this. It's gone down. And each corridor, each prong has to be on its own. So ultimately at the head, they don't have troops to get their political objectives. That is why if you see, now they have to reinforce where, you know, for, for the past two days, they're saying some 40 kilometer convoy coming. Mm. For that 40 kilometer convoy has not crossed 200 kilometers for two days. Okay. It's stuck. I mean, it will come eventually. Kiev will be surrounded, all that. But will they be able to take over Kiev? Difficult. I don't think they have the uh, strength to do so. And what's worse, there's, there was talk that they were asking Belarus also to join in. If mm -hmm. Belarus has to join in at this stage with their army, definitely Russia is running short of uh, troops. Okay, overall. And then suddenly you come out with a nuclear card. Why do you come out with a nuclear card? You come out with a nuclear card because things are not going well. Or your aim and objectives are not being met. So this multi-pronged thing looks very good on paper. Fantastic. But very difficult to execute. And mind you, this is not my view alone. Eh? You are Mr. McMaster, General McMaster, or for that matter, General Patrios. They also speak like this. They've written about it. Mm. Not about this particular operation, but in other operations, they've written about it. You, like you said, Dhaka, we were converging. You look at uh, Enduring Freedom, Gulf War. The thrust was simultaneous. So these people have violated fundamentals. I mean, they must be having reasons for that. I don't uh, restrict. But they have, I think their political aim and their military plan, there was no consonants. Sir, sir the, you know, I'm just going to take a more, minute more with regards to this multi-pronged approach. The northern approach came in towards Kiev, all right. The eastern approach went to Kharkiv, I mean, uh, that area as it yeah. is controlled more or less by the Russians, the Donbass region and stuff like that. I'm not sure as to what was the objective in that entire place. The southern part was to cut off uh, Ukraine from the sea. Uh, that could have been See, done with, with a simple blockade. Why? Did look, they... uh, look, 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 look. You have to understand what we I told you in the beginning. Mm. The premise by which Russia started this campaign was that Whatever happened earlier, if I do the same thing in a bigger scale, I'll be able to achieve it. They'll fall down. Since the premise was wrong, then they said, okay, I will do this. I mean, if you look at this thrust, what are, what are they planning? Topple Kiev, put a government there, take over Crimea, give a land bridge to that area of uh, Kherson to Mariupol, which is the southern coast of the thing. Get hold of Donbass, get hold of Kharkiv. That means one full slice of, uh, you know, Ukraine to the east. Take it off. So they wanted all this with this. If you, if you have planned all this, you have a premise that you will be able to achieve it with the force. And that premise is that past experience. <laughs> Where did it come unstuck? Let me put it now itself. The kind, of, like which I told earlier, the kind of information and intelligence which the Americans gave Ukraine, everyone felt that Ukraine is not prepared. Politically, they were seen to be, you know, bumbling, gay, war, all that. But I think the Ukrainian army were very knew very clearly what to do. They they must have known that this is what Russians will do and this is what we should do. And this is what the in, into a getting. If this fellow does this, I'll do that. And they've done that. So, okay. I mean, this is something which has not come out in public, but this is my firm conviction. Otherwise, you couldn't have done all, I mean, they also couldn't have done all this. No, absolutely. Yes. They, had a, they, had, they had a defensive plan. They had a clear, in based defensive plan. And they executed it. They've not wavered from it also. 
no russians give that that we can discuss the russians give enough opportunities for uh, uh, ukrainians to continue that we can talk sir so you know lots to learn for us as well in terms of uh, you know analyzing what the enemy reaction would be and that's something yeah. that very very critical and that's what you're bringing out very very clearly that past uh, experiences can only make you learn but it should not be a base of your future operations so come on mutual fund utna sahi nahi hai fund manager ne kaha yeah past performance doesn't guarantee future results sir yeah. yeah, absolutely sir absolutely i think that's a punchline sir for uh, yeah. this my war mm-hmm. so yeah. what about uh, this thing uh, you know cyber operations russia is supposed to be feared globally feared with regard cyber operations they've hit even china before and the chinese have reported it um the cyber operations yes there were reports of some attack here some attack there but nothing really substantial that came out of this what does that tell you and what should we learn i i think there's a lot to learn from the cyber business cyber as a domain is a dangerous domain there's no doubt about it it can paralyze your networks you can paralyze everything a b c d e okay and both sides russia and ukraine were involved in cyber attacks uh, before the operations started mm. before but when you look at the kinetic part of this campaign there is no way there is no mention everywhere i've trolled all kinds of net ea wall all kinds of uh, channels and think tanks and all where cyber attacks have influenced the outcome of a battle or a action they might have slowed down and if you look at it the cyber tool is a tool of gray zone operations it's cheap it's not traceable mm. you don't know where it comes from uh, you can't ascribe this thing so you go and attack a power station put out the power supply or a train network or some network you slow down okay you finger something you can do that and it creates lot of problem in peace in as part of gray zone operations but when it comes to hard operations cyber has i think very little value limited value unless you are fully networked mm. unless the armies are fully networked and you have a handle into that network i mean that the thing for us is that look if you don't go so much on networks but just stick to good communications strong communications alternate forms of communications layered communications with certain amount of networking and go light on data you can't be interfered with which means the entire cyber domain and this is my conviction from a long time has to be rethought of in war right and i have spoken i mean i have spoken to cyber experts and all that everyone says oh cyber does the cyber does that yeah cyber does everything but it can't do everything you want a country like china can't you know uh, do everything yeah you can go if it's a small country you can go and control some critical uh, you know network of that com- uh, country and coerce it but you can't do that to big countries i don't think anyone has that capability and now that this has come people are taking uh, measures to ensure that uh, you know you are proofed against cyber attacks everyone is conscious of this mm. the domain will be very good in multi domain operations cyber as a domain in gray zone operations tremendous results but in hot war my i have reservations would you also say the same thing for a country like china which is highly you know dependent doesn't matter no i mean uh, doesn't matter an attack on china from somewhere Look, else yeah that's a vulnerability if you see we discussed this business of uh, the chinese uh, 
in terms yeah. of no not information of their operational concepts mm. they lay a lot of emphasis on informatization and intelligization yes. that is basically ai cyber networking and all that right now if you are so dependent on them and they get disturbed where do you go so i have always maintained to defeat china a country which is so dependent on electronics like china or rather actually it's not so dependent so far it doesn't have that capability but it is seeking that capability mm. that means you have to just interfere with it or feed it wrong information correct you have to find ways to do that that's not a big thing you don't have to hack also okay so they become vulnerable so you have to you know india has to find ways and means to pose the threat to china mm. we are not interested in the gray zone operations you know i am not talking of gray zone i am talking of actual hot war operations how do you do it how do you do it in the himalayas period even if you have to do phys- do it physically so be it right so that is something which we have to seriously think of simultaneously like i said you be light on uh, data and light on networking i want to when i say light you do the bare minimum so that you are not dependent on networking go strong on communications and look war is ultimately not a matter of data ai and all that it's a matter of people people fight wars commanders are people who think you have to apply your mind to take a decision just because you have four sets of data in front of you the best data doesn't give you the best decision this is absolutely. absolutely if that was a case this should have been game set and match by now they could have been complete yeah. information and breakdown of yeah 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 look if you go by numbers by now ukraine should have been a vassal state of russia it yeah. didn't happen okay i mean to put it very the thing one comedian upset your entire apple cart you bloody be ashamed of it <laughs> i mean that is a top class guy my hats off to him for what he's done who's to he's turned around the situation beaten the narratives on top of it yeah yeah uh, i mean the outcomes that something that we're going to discuss what are the changes that are going to come out in the world order see what's more is in the terms of information cyber all this story the narrative today in public domain is of the west and the uh, ukrainians the russian narrative has been blanketed out completely and mind you the russians have a good narrative yes they have a strong case the whole story if you go back trace it back the problem is not with russia the problem is with nato and this is what a lot of people have written including old man kissinger okay the root cause of this problem lies in nato nato yes but that is now gone the narrative is of poor ukraine poor ukraine west being this thing a evil kind of a russia is coming out brave zelensky and, yeah and lot of people you, you remember that german uh, naval chief who was sacked yeah. what did he say give respect to putin and everything will be sorted out he was not wrong right so the, in the battle of narratives today what, the swing is this side whereas and uh, russian narrative is now totally off whatever russia says no one believes it even russians have stopped believing it now and this so the big the big story for us is we what is our narrative whether it's against pakistan or against china and narratives directly affect outcomes of conflicts it's a military lesson it's a major military lesson that you need to have your narrative straight absolutely the narrative war mm. okay 
<clears throat> so that's important and this narrative will influence outcomes you see this narrative which is now coming all of a sudden you find germany arming itself people are now talking even japan has uh, started the nuclear debate finland so th things are changing narrative what is our narrative what should be our national narrative whether it's against china or against pakistan we should be clear yeah, absolutely and this is in spite of the so called uh, and putin called out the neo nazi problem in ukraine which is a big that's a different right, that's a different story that's what i'm saying there that's is a problem a but that's been uh, brushed aside now no one bothers about it absolutely absolutely and uh, there are there are western uh, documentaries which are there on this american documentaries vice and so on yeah so yeah there the like problem. i said if the last article by kissinger outlines all these issues absolutely sir coming to the i think your favorite subject the long range firepower i mean we've we've all seen these videos of these little little rockets flying across uh, these cruise missiles going at low level um you know this is probably the first time the world has ever seen a cruise missile actually flying over overhead and uh, you know going and hitting a target it seems so uh, you know harmless and slow uh, but the effect is quite devastating the use of long range artillery how do you perceive what the russians have done right in terms of usage of his long range artillery and rocket forces and what were the gaps and what should we learn in india sir look the first thing which comes out of this entire operation is that in any operation tomorrow firepower matters you don't have firepower you are a write off finished and against china you need a lot of firepower because they are laying a lot of emphasis on informatization and precision and long range fires and you look at the way they built up their missile systems and the way they are building up their air fields in tibet they got to lay a lot of emphasis on fire pa and you have to fight fire with fire this myopic thought that you know uh, air force and art, long range artillery are supporting arms and all that that's i think we have to get out of that mindset yes sir okay now let's see let's analyze this uh in the past four days what has happened when the whole thing started on day 1 your the way russians employed firepower in conjunction with their they first built battlefield transparency through their information ops intelligence ops they knew the targets they had very clear idea as to what targets to hit and they hit targets all over the country i mean you can show the map to the viewers uh they hit targets all over the country using air and long range artillery when i say long range artillery rockets missiles cruise missiles guns right all over and i thought that was fantastic because it just opened up the can one didn't know where the maneuver was coming from and it opened up maneuver space for russia and then of course then they followed it up with this three prongs and all that and for the first two uh, for uh, 24 48 hours it was not clear where the prongs were going mm. people spoke of uh, donetsk and people spoke of odessa and all where nothing has happened so it it crystallized into three so you did a certain amount of masking you did a certain amount of enablement of moving you gave maneuver space to these people so fire power creates maneuver long range fire power creates maneuver that is something which we should not forget and mind you when i say long range fire power you talk about manned unmanned uh, air and ground based fire power long range that something which i have written in my uh, series on artillery and fire power in my blog so that's the first thing Now, the second thing which happened and it this is very funny in the in the period from 24 hours to 72 hours for some reason the russian air force didn't come into play why i don't know uh, this has come up 
there's a think tank the rusi uh, thing uh, rusi which is a british think tank uh, royal institute of uh, royal uh, united services and thing and even south china morning post has come out saying that the soviet aircraft uh, soviet air force was missing in action the number of sorties carried out was far less than what they did even in syria now the moment that element has taken out your firepower is reduced right and why this has happened probably they didn't knock off complete ukrainian air defense mm. so they must have lost a few and they said look we are in trouble so we'll take the air out and we'll continue with ground operations maybe it was a deliberate plan i don't know i mean i cannot comment on it it could be both ways that we will not use too much air force we will use only ground forces the moment that happened it gave opportunity for ukraine to get in it gave space to ukraine and ukraine started using its air force what little had and then ukraine had the space now to use whatever little ground based firepower they had so when you use firepower you have to use, then use it concentrated integrated with the full effect your ground based firepower and rockets missiles cruise missiles must complement the air they have to be used synergistically i mean guns ka to abhi the turn turn has not come only long range guns it is only basically long range uh, uh, rockets and stuff long uh, yeah okay and precision kills and you have to have precision ability in this yes right now why the russians didn't use air force is it training we don't know is it lack of ammunition we don't know is it lack of intelligence we don't know or is it a faulty plan we don't know it will come out why why they didn't use it or maybe that's the premise that whatever we use is good enough to topple uh, yeah fast performance okay now in this i found a very innovative way of using uh, you know the long range smurch rockets by ukraine it, i read it what they did they knew probably by the end of the first day they knew which routes the russians were coming by they laid ambushes mm. not a typical ambush they designated a killing ground a convoy comes into this area they knew okay from here to here the convoy will span so wow. they kept that area under observation they kept a smudge rocket somewhere in hide and that smudge can hit you from 70 to 80 kilometers away if not next door but that area was under observation with drones and you know everything and from a hide a smudge battery or a whatever they have, i mean i don't know the numbers they would have gone into a firing position fired and scooted and whoever is in that convoy or that in that killing zone gone now is that killing and mind you smudge is a area weapon okay it's not a it it's not a this thing so if you fire a salvo of smudge a battery worth you will take out about 8 to 9 kilometers in one go so there's a convoy about 8 to 9 kilometers in that 8 to 9 kilometers it's gone they've done that you have to think differently why am i saying you have to think differently on this is there's something very innovative if you look at the tibetan plateau it is flat and open yeah limited roads you can fire you can plan these ambushes you can ambush their missiles also you don't need too many for ambush you need two troop you need two launchers that's good enough it upsets the apple cart the surprise factor yeah hey you combine this whole thing with special forces put them insert special forces designate your uh, ambush points or killing grounds and in the tibetan thing if you can control the eastern uh, express highway and the western express highway opposite the lac you can add it sir you they have had it i mean we have to think differently on this issue i've been screaming my head off for that 
the AF chief and the army chief have to sit together and said, this is how we're going to fight this battle. Flip. Can the Chinese do that? They can't. Why can't they do it? They don't have the Air Force to do it. They'll never have the Air Force to do it. They might have some Air Force, they'll never have it. Second, uh, even if they have the missiles and rockets and all, even if it's precision, the terrain on our own side is very steep. You know, especially in Sikkim and Arunachal and all that. You know, if the missile or the thing misses the mountain, it goes into a cut or it stays on top. Nothing will happen. Efficacy is low. Whereas on the other side, Tibet is a tabletop. Absolutely no camouflage. This is something which I think is a big lesson for us. Use terrain, use your firepower, use standoff. People talk of standoff. Okay. People talk of non-contact warfare. We should convert all this. And mind you, for what I'm try trying to say, we don't have to... Uh, Too much. Too much. We all have, we have the wherewithal. We have to just put it together. I mean, let me elucidate. For some funny reason, our UAVs and long-range vectors are not matched. I've written about it. There's a fight. Who will hold the UAVs? Is it Air Force or Navy? Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, Army. Army. Synergy. That is where theater commands come into play. Joint operations come into play. So, there's a big learning in this. So a lot of people are asking this question, why isn't Kiev taking out a 40, 60 mile long convoy standing outside when everyone knows where they are and it will be a disaster. Look, uh, let's be also realistic. Ukraine has only that much force. Probably they don't have, they, from what I can make out, Ukraine is at the end of its military sustenance. They might not have. What they're doing is buying time. If they can delay that convoy, another 24 hours, which they've done already, 12 hours already is gone. Okay, call it logistic problem. I don't know what it is, but that thing has not moved. It's like a snake which is lying there. <laughs> you know, in Telugu, they say, that means a snake which has eaten uh, sand and sleeping. And that convoy like that is lying there. It will come into play eventually. But today, time is of essence there. It's not coming into play. The farther it goes back, more things will happen here. The narrative will become even worse for the Russians. Probably it's just a trap. Let's see. And now that the talks have started, that is also put a little more back. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, there, there's a lot to left in this whole game. Oh, absolutely, sir. The military analysis obviously is going to continue. And uh, what exactly happens? Do they actually get into a street fight or surround Ukraine? Yeah, yeah, we'll see. It's, it's going to be we'll an what topic of discussion because uh, that will be how the Russians actually use the available resources in front of them. Uh, do they See, improve? from wh what is happening, one thing is clear. There's not going to be a military victory. Yeah. Going to be a... No military victory for Russia in this. Even if it is, it's going to be a tough one. Very tough one. There will be a political... It has to be a political solution. Absolutely. If the system continues, it will degenerate into insurgency or a hybrid asymmetric uh, affair. Which the, they are saying already. Yeah, yeah. And Ukraine, with the kind of uh, help it is getting from uh, the uh, EU and other nations, it is well, it will be well capable of handling it. Eastern Ukraine, Eastern, or the Western Ukraine, is still untouched. <clears throat> so, 
any air power given coming from the european union can still be deployed by ukrainians in the west and applied in the east right in the worst case enmesh uh, russia in a built up area battle right so the political solution has to come in and for that political solution to come in or a political uh, you know keyhole to appear there has to be some military definition which has not come so, so russia will press on with this whole story ukraine will keep resisting at what stage will the tipping point come for both people where they say okay i can't progress further and i cannot sustain any more losses and say okay let's start talking seriously this is the question a lot is going to happen before that point comes in sir looking at the situation let's see. Uh, yeah i agree with you use pounding with weapons into uh, this thing i i was just reading an update the polish are sending mig 29s into ukraine there is some story of bulgaria sending in some 35 40 Su 25s and so on, so yeah. maybe quite a lot of reinforcement coming in. There, there are thousands and thousands of missiles coming in. So I don't know how this is going to be used. It's going to be a totally different uh, ball game once this okay. offensive restarts. Yeah, let us see how things happen because they, we shouldn't forget there's a nuclear card also somewhere hanging. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Yeah. I mean, the, that that threat is clear and present. it's been photographed as well sir the nato has released yeah. some graphs of uh, nuclear weapons getting prepared and all that uh, i'm sure we will have to uh, you know revisit this entire military campaign because right now it's on a kind of a pause where nothing much is happening one out rocket here and there and stuff like that it's not a very very effective campaign being run run by the russians it's once it restarts uh, i'll be sure to you know uh, push jen shankar to give us an update as to what he sees is going to happen and of course an analysis of from the full stop to the restart what really worked for the russians uh, let me underline here we are not trying to analyze we are trying to analyze the ukrainian war but we are majorly trying to see where india can learn a lesson um, at the end of it it is a battle scenario for india as well with pakistan on one side that we underestimate most of the times and that is something that general shankar also brought out the past premise cannot be used as a this thing so those of us who are brow beating about the 71 war great thing but we need to kind of update us look ourselves. ahead and of course with the chinese we beaten them back uh, 75 you know 1975 some wrong chu 67 67 67 67, 67. yeah 67 eastern ladakh and then now eastern ladakh but they might have some hidden game in their rope which they have not shown us as of now so we need to look forward and that i think is the bottom line of this particular discussion thank you so for bringing that out and till next time for another analysis jai hind jai hind and i'll cap it up with saying past performance is not a guarantee for future results i think all of us who who invest in mutual funds is going to agree to that and even the share market for that matter <laughs> looking at the situation today thank you sir jai hind Welcome, Jen. Yeah.